behind. No, I can't. <laughs> okay. Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Seeking Sustainability Live. This is number 316. And I am catching up with Heather Fukase of Nagano Naturally. Thank you so much for joining again. Thank you for having me. So last year we were talking and I think it was June. So around summertime last year, I'm sure a lot has happened for you over this last year and we're in a different season. So last time we talked, you were outside, um, a little bit colder now in Nagano, is that right? Yes, yes, yes. We had a hard frost this morning. So yes, a tad colder. <laughs> Well, tell us a little bit about uh, what kind of uh, farming that you do, and is it three fields that you guys are managing? Just give us a reminder. Okay, so we have the rice field, and then we have uh, two rows of apples, so about 36 green apples, and then we have um, two other fields that are we have in vegetable production with uh, wheat, slash rye and last year I tried oats for the first time but um yeah mainly mainly vegetables and rice and yes so that that's our apples oh wow that's a while yeah that's um that that's looking from the apples over the empty wheat field all right let me this is the first time using this interface so please forgive me everybody if it's a little bit uh like covering our faces like just now I will try to work it out. Let's see. <laughs> so that's heirloom tomatoes. So yeah, I'm going... it looks amazing. I, I wanted to show this picture because you are trying to do natural farming and <laughs> you showed this picture to show that you are kind of doing farming in uh, unison with weeds. How would you put it? <laughs> yeah, I would say the path of least resistance. <laughs> uh, if you look very carefully to the left of the crate of tomatoes, you can see that that's actually a tomato bush. You can see a small yellow flower. <laughs> so, but actually, yeah, we keep the, I use a, I use a lawnmower and like a weed whacker and we don't try and remove all the weeds. A, it, it's a lot of work and B, um, because we're on a slope, actually having something on the ground stops uh, water erosion. Cause you know, like in Japan, you go nothing, nothing, nothing. And then you get like a month worth of rain in a day. And that can cause huge like erosion tunnels through the um, soil. And because a lot of what we do is about building healthy soil, we you know we're, we're giving people, but we don't want to give that to our neighbors. So, <laughs> so yeah, so actually it does look like I just don't care, but there's method to the madness. <laughs> Oh, oh, we, we have, have a, a little visitor this morning. You want to say hello? <laughs> and you, I have cats, you have chickens. Yeah. I love, I love seeing the pictures and hearing the stories about the chickens. Um, <laughs> and recently you had a really funny story about making the wasps drunk. <laughs> yeah. So basically, yeah, yeah, that I was, um, we, we have a lot of wasps around here. And again, I'm like, uh, wasps actually have a lot of good jobs to do in the garden. Now, I'm not saying I want them in my house, but in their place in the garden, I actually don't have a problem with wasps. Um, but I noticed the wasp buzzing sounded odd. And I was like, they really sounded like, you know, like a car that was revving and revving and couldn't get started. And I was like, that was, and I was looking around, where are the wasps? And that pail of apples is actually the ones that are so bad that I didn't use them which means they were already too bad to sell, which means they were already too bad for the farmer to sell. So these are like fourth rank apples. And I keep them in a bucket and then I add rice bran, which is what you get when you polish rice. It's the leftover. And I mix that up and make kind of a chunky stew <laughs> for the chooks, the chickens. And uh, it had been in the sun and I guess it fermented. And uh, when I got closer, I realized the wasps couldn't fly and I could also really strongly smell alcohol. So I think I had drunk wasps. <laughs> but um, but yeah, now it's, 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 it's it, you can tell it gets cold and you go from wasps to nothing. Like the amount of pollinators, um, it just drops completely off. So yes, I think they, wow. they were all sleeping yeah. off. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm fascinated by this. And of course, because you're in Nagano, uh, your season's a little bit advanced, like from where we are in Hiroshima. So it's a bit oh. colder there. 
Um, but some of the vegetables that you were talking about that you can grow for a really long time, uh, for example, cucumbers, you were talking about like oh, yeah. you, you love growing a certain kind of cucumber, right? Yeah. So I think, um, I, I don't know a lot about, um, the lovely warm parts of Japan, but I follow a couple of farmers in Okayama and I get the feeling that your summer is a little bit too hot to grow maybe. So a lot of the farms tend to grow a spring crop and then an autumn winter crop. Whereas for us, we um, have like a hard stop when uh, oh, that, there's, yeah, that's one thing we do winter. I, that, that's a wheat field that I've planted up for winter. But I found cucumbers that are autumn cucumbers and you don't plant them until Auburn, so until August, which is great because the early ones that you planted in the spring are feeling a bit sad and tired by then. And this gives me an, an entire extra crop of cucumbers all the way through. I think I picked my last ones third week in September, which is really impressive for Chia. <laughs> for Nagano, that was impressive. <laughs> Yeah, it was it was really impressive. Uh, well, I've I've struggled to grow almost anything in my little garden, um, but where I was uh, renting before, we had a bit more garden space, and it just it de probably depends on each area about how much sunshine, how much rain you're getting. Um, you managing three different fields, so you drive from field to field. How does that work? Well, um, the small like kitchen garden is actually connected to my house. So that one's very easy. Um, I can walk through the apple orchard, not my apple orchards, but I know the owner. I can walk through the orchard and walk to my field. But just because I'm usually carrying a lot of equipment, um, I do tend to just drive the truck. But it's like a two minute drive to each of the fields. Um, and it's my husband and I, it's our, our one like together moment every morning we drive around and have a look at the three fields together and just talk about what I did yesterday or what I'm planning for the next day and I, I ask his advice on some stuff or just point out the interesting things and uh it's just it's our together time <laughs> nice uh speaking of your husband mm -hmm. I love this uh this video that you shared through Instagram and you guys are using such interesting, like old traditional techniques for the rice planting or the here, the rice weeding, right? Ah, the chain. Um, but yes. also you're using, of course, modern tools and machinery mm -hmm. as well. Tell us about this. this is so interesting. So, um, yeah, like you say, this is a really old um, idea, but um, it's modernized. He actually, he made that himself because we we plant our rice further apart because we don't use any agricultural chemicals we um airflow is really important for us because a lot of the mildews and spots and things that you get often it's because there's like w moist leaves rubbing against each other so we have a little extra space in the rice paddy um which at first i was like oh what a waste we could plant more but you're better off to get a successful crop and and so the chains run between the rows of rice and the wooden um, the wooden crossbar does flatten the rice seedlings, but they bounce up again. And there's actually a hormone, um, it's a really interesting research if you're ever driving around. The very outside edge of a rice paddy will have slightly taller rice, even in conventionally grown rice. And it's because when the wind hits it, it moves slightly, which like promotes strong growth because it has to, it goes, oh gee, you know, um, I'm getting a little bit buffeted here. So e even in like um, in nurseries where they grow seedlings, they'll, they'll quite often use a fan overhead so that the seedlings don't get long and leggy. They grow kind of sturdy. So it, it, it the, the chain gets the weeds and then the crossbar going across the top has the extra effect of kind of a little bit of stress on the rice, why it's just enough stress to make them be a little bit stronger. But I think I said in the video, you've got to get your timing right. If you do it too early, the roots haven't properly like connected to the ground. And as you go, you just pull up every piece of rice. And then there's a definite end point because when seedlings are very young, they're quite flexible. And then as they get older, they'll bend, but they'll kink or like, um, what do you call it? Yeah, they'll like, you'll, you'll end up with like a crack in them. So there's a, there's a limited time that you can do it. 
but if you get enough done then you um after that the rice grows taller and then there's shade and then there's less weed pressure so we did really well with weed suppression this year because we had the timing right so yeah it was very exciting in a very nerdy way i'm like look at the small weeds the puny weeds <laughs> I love it. It's innovation, but kind of in an old yes, way, yeah. you know, and it, it, whatever works. I love this about following your feed is that <laughs> you're working things out along the way and you're just making things work. What is it? One time you didn't have the truck and you ended up filling your little mini car uh, full of full of harvest that you just had to get somewhere, right? <laughs> My poor car. I often think if there's ever like, you know, a get together of all the Nissan marches in Japan, mine is going to be the one that everyone's like, oh, my gosh, you poor thing, because it, it gets abused. <laughs> but, you know, if there's a sudden rainstorm, I'm like, I've got to go and do it. I've got to go and get it now. This is my big achievement for the year. I learned how to drive the tractor. So it's so uh, exciting. <laughs> so I want to hear about that. So you said you don't need a special license. Is that right? Yeah. So I only have an automatic license. I got my license when I had a toddler and I was pregnant. And I just thought I need the quickest, easiest, simplest license to get. And so I signed up for the automatic course. And because the tractor has a clutch, and it's farm machinery, I assumed that I would need a special license or at least a manual license to drive a tractor. And it came up in a conversation um, that, no, you don't. And I was like, well, why have I never learned how to drive the tractor then? <laughs> so, um, so yeah, but actually, I don't, I don't think I mentioned, but this was my very first lesson. That's my first field. And if you look at the edge of the picture, you can see I didn't go to the edge because I was quite scared. That's why there's quite a lot of grass left at the end. But after watching me go up and down once and taking some photos for me, my husband said, OK, I'll go down to the rice paddy and get the straw then. And I'm like, are you not worried that I'll forget any of the instructions, like how to stop it? Like, <laughs> But he's very confident in my skills. So and it was OK. The, the tractor is fine. But I did think if it was the other way around, I probably would have hung around a little longer than being like, OK, you got this. See you later. <laughs> I can't, I can't hear you anymore. You're muted. Is this the same tractor uh, on one of your wheat fields? I love following this on Instagram. You were talking about your whole day. So you had to take your kids to the station to go to school. You had to make lunch, um, what time you started. And then you just learned from the manual how to drive a tractor and how not to kill yourself. And then you went out and did it. I just love that. That was the that was the um the the wheat binder. I was really annoyed because we hadn't got it done, and I thought, I wonder if the manual is online, and it was. So I printed it out, and I literally had the manual in one hand <laughs> while I was working things out. And uh, yeah, and then yeah, and that machine is also still working. So, but yeah, I you know a day is never boring, and often a day. Like when you wake up in the morning and you have your cup of coffee, you're like, this is what I'm going to achieve today. And then at the other end of the day and you're like, well, that didn't happen, but I got that done instead. <laughs> and it looks like you're doing like like we showed before. So that was a modern machine. And then you're also doing sometimes hand tools um, yeah, yeah. like this scythe, is it? Yeah, I, I, I think like a hand scythe. Yeah. Um, again, like. I would there there are some really hardcore people who you know do zero petrol farming so they do everything by hand and kudos to them because it's hard enough to do even the way we do it um we're not that hardcore but what we do do is because like as you can see here we don't worry about the weeds we don't use any herbicides and there are areas where um it's not easy for the automatic machine to get it or you'd have to push the the machine up so here was um there was a really there was really bad germination and so there's a lot of it was collecting a lot of grass before it collected enough oats so i just decided to do it by hand so we have all the tools so um yeah so i do do some stuff by hand but i wouldn't say that that's an important part of our philosophy like using hand tools an important part is not wasting anything and growing naturally but where possible i do like to use things that don't take 10 times as long. 
But no, I'm thinking, I, you know, I don't know much about tools, but sometimes when we have people visiting us uh, from other countries, they always comment about how great the old style tools are in Japan. Is that right? Has yeah. something you noticed as well? Yeah, this particular one's not. I'd, I'd say this is just a cheap one, but the really old school ones, like we've got a wooden, I don't know, it looks to me it looks like a mallet, but they call it a hammer. But and the handle and the head are held together by a chalk that goes through the middle. So, and literally it broke one time and you just wheel, like just use an ax and cut another chalk and you just keep going. And um, I've got a machete that the blade has been worn down. Like the, the blade is narrower in the center because it's, it's so old and it's been used for so long. And just the balance of the tools I mean, the, the balance between the handle and the blade and just the way I think there's a I think a lot of pride was put into old, old tools. And there are still um, like, you know, all, old individ, independent shops that will make tools to the old specification. So um, we needed an extra piece um, for a tractor and our tractor is so old and uh, they, they went and they were able to um, just make a piece that fitted it. So. Yeah, this is that was splitting green bamboo. I was we have a lot of bamboo, and every year we have to cut some down. And so I thought, why not? And yeah, I was in the chook cage making the chooks things, and they were under my feet and on my shoulders. And <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, this is another old school one where you put the the hatchet in, and then you hit it with a hammer to split it open. So again, yeah, they're just these old the old ways of doing things. I think are really interesting to know. And while you don't use them every day. When you do need to use them, if you know what to do, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's a great skill to have. That's awesome. And you mentioned uh, when we talked last time that a lot of your neighbors are really supportive, like at first very skeptical of what you guys were going to be able to do, but then lend a hand if they see that you need help sometime. Has that still been the case? Yeah, yeah. Although the, the more we're able to do, the less they feel sorry for us, which is, you know, that's a good thing. <laughs> but it, yeah, I feel like, um, and now, now I've got to the stage where they'll be like, what's that? And I'll say, oh, it's a, you know, it's a butternut. It's a different kind of pumpkin. And I'm like, do you want one? And they're like, oh, wow. And then, so I've, I've, I, it feels fabulous to be on the giving back end of things. Like for so long, you know, they were helping me out and they were very much, it was a, a, an uneven relationship where I was very much on the receiving end of all kindnesses. But, um, and I, 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 I grow uh, a couple of Halloween pumpkins, even when I'm not growing them to sell, which I didn't this year, just because monkeys decimated them last year. And I'm like, I, I don't need two bad years in a row. Yeah. <laughs> so I always grow a couple and I give them out to the neighbors who've got kids. And uh, yeah, I think it's, 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 it's nice to be able to give back, but uh but yeah, this Those was you can great. See sunburn. You were oh, you were talking about these being sunburnt a little yeah. bit. Um, would cactus? you like have a shade system in future to stop sunburn pumpkins? Yeah, I, I don't think, know how that happens. This is the first year that this was an issue, and it wasn't just an issue for my pumpkins. It was a huge issue for apple farmers. Um, we had a really bizarrely long and hot and very sunny summer. Um, and then torrential rain in August, which caused its own problems. But the the long and hot sun meant that, um, yeah, a lot of things got sunburned. So, yeah, in future, um, I might have to run shade cloth over it or um, maybe even <gasps> shock, do away with the weed mat and so that encourage more weeds around them. But, again, then the balance is difficult between um, – you don't want rot. So if you get a wet summer and you've left lots of grass around them, then there's moisture sitting around them. So, but you know, a new challenge each year. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's good to learn. And what yeah. I've heard, uh, we had that very strange comment uh, recently. Was it one of the government officials also? And he's talking about how climate change is great for rice because it's making it more delicious. But the the local Hokkaido farmers were saying, actually, we are having to change the kind yes. of plants we can yes. grow because yes. of climate change. Have you found that as well? Yeah. Um, like I'm not, I'm not involved with J.A. Nagano, but J.A. is definitely constantly doing research. Um, 
the variety of apples that they grow here, they're going for a shorter season apple because we get late, late frosts are becoming more common, which means that they wipe out the apple flowers. Um, so they're now looking for uh, apples that flower later and then um, just the more humidity and hotter summers, they're looking for more heat resistant varieties. So definitely um, there's always research going on and always new varieties coming up. Um, and I think, yeah, like it's, it's easy to say, yeah, look, you know, now Hokkaido can grow this, which they couldn't grow before, but that's not always a good thing. <laughs> like, and it's not a simple matter of, oh, we just picked this off the shelf. There's a lot of work that goes into it. And um, it's, you know, it's a very sad story often because it means that people are cutting down 10, 20 year old trees and having to start again. Um, I mean, I was talking to one of the apple farmers recently and she said they used to spray 13 times a year and they're up to 20 now because they, there's so many more problems. Um, and even with spraying 20 times a year, this year there was a number of leaf illnesses just from the weather not being suitable. So I have a feeling that in the next 10, 20 years, like even what districts are famous for might end up changing just because, you know, it's going to get, if, if climate change continues and it doesn't seem like there's much chance of that not being the case, what you're able to grow um, and, you know, the margins on agriculture are not great anyway. And there's going to get to a point where they say, look, it's just not worth growing apples. Like, you know, we can't, we can't, it's a lot of work. We're losing crop and, you know, we need something else. So, yeah, I'm, at the moment, it's all about finding new varieties of existing crops that suit the new um, climate, the new problems. But I, yeah, I feel like there's a, you know, surely there's going to be an end to that, a limit to what you can do. And when then you, you're going to have to say, okay, do we start growing mikan in Nagano? <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's, yeah, who knows? But it's, it's really, it is, it feels very uncertain at the moment. Yeah. Well, you mentioned uh, the difficulty of of the for the apple growers. Now, yeah. this is something I would love to talk to you about. That you are helping your neighbor apple growers, uh, not organic apples that they're doing, but they're they're using less pesticides, and you're helping them sell seconds. Talk to us yes. a little bit about second. Wow. <laughs> so I actually helped out on their farm for a full year. I did all of the different jobs, not every day, but I did all of the jobs for the year because A, they needed the help and B, I was really into like, I live in an apple area and I see people out there, but I was never sure, you know, exactly what they were doing. And um, the more I learned about it, I actually got quite like angry for them at the incredible high standards um, for apples that can be sold commercially. Um, I mean, especially in a country where most apples are served, peeled and cut. I do, it does not make any sense to me that uh, an apple that is not perfectly red, the same color red all over, is, is unsellable. An apple that's lost the little brown stick at the top, the apple stalk, that's a juicing apple. It's unsellable. Um, apples that are not uniform shape and they actually have a board with like circles punched out and it has to be uniform shape uh, and fit through one of the holes so oversized apples undersized apples apples with this um mottling i mean that one's obviously got a split that's obviously a second but there are apples that are just the problem with the apple is the color or where an apple has rubbed against another apple um and yet you can see they have weeds in their field too. Yeah. <laughs> they actually they have a lot of mint in their field now because as they walk around, they say it smells nice for them. And they also believe that um, strongly smelling herbs might have some um, effect at keeping the uh, insects away. But And also, who doesn't love a farmer in bright red leather boots? I mean, really. <laughs> I can't believe she wears leather boots. Like, yeah, is that good enough? Like water repellent enough? It looks I, I cool. On rainy days, she wouldn't. But she's, uh, yeah, she's Brazilian and she always has painted nails too. She's the only apple farmer I know who has a gorgeous manicure. <laughs> it looks cool and it matches the color of the apples. I love it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's just, yes, yeah, so there's just so many reasons why an apple can't be sold. And those apples um, are then taken down to the juice, the juice factories, and they don't get money at all. And this is, it's literally like a 365 day a year job. They're always out there. And one of the big jobs they do is removing the leaves from around the each 
individual apple in September so that the apples can color up properly. And I did this job and it's so hard because if you bump an apple, by September, the apples are really heavy. They're getting quite big and heavy. And if you bump it into the branch, it can bruise. If you bump it hard enough, it can fall off and then it's not sellable. And the, it just seems a lot of work for, to me, a completely ridiculous reason. Like, you know, we don't need the busy work of removing individual leaves from around apples so that they're color pretty when every Japanese house that I've ever been served an apple in, it was peeled. So, like, so yeah. So I, 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 I have never with... been served with the skin on, like very, maybe just a few times. Um, we always eat the skin. And I need to mention that I just got this huge box <laughs> of these beautiful apples and we are loving them. They taste so amazing. And I cannot believe that they are rejected for these yeah. tiny little blemishes. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a great service that you're doing, collaborating with uh, your neighbor farmers. I love it. Yeah, and I mean it really helps them because depending on the year, they they if they have a bad year, um, they have a lot of harvest day payments due on like equipment and on insurance and on everything, and they can yeah you, you it, it it can be a very difficult time of year um this year we haven't had typhoons but there's also been times when they get like you know weeks away from harvest and then a typhoon comes through and then anything that falls off the tree is not sellable either so it's just there's just and people like to eat fruit like i mean i grew up that if you said mom i'm hungry she'd say have a piece of fruit like it was i feel like it's great for people to get like not one or two or, you know, five apples to be able to buy five kilos or 10 kilos of apples and just, you know, enjoy eating apples. And it's a really huge service to the, to yet yeah, to Amelia and her family. And uh, yeah, I just feel like, and, and it makes everybody happy, right? <laughs> ah, absolutely. I love it. Um, now let's talk about wheat because the first time we talked, you were talking about having a problem yes. with your wheat, um, but it looked like you had a really good uh, harvest this year. Tell us about it. Yeah. So last last time we spoke, we I probably had just finished harvesting and we had what was called black spot, which was at the germ of every grain of wheat. There was a problem. And the big worry there is that we grow all our wheat from saved seed that we've kept ourselves. So I was not just worried about one season, whether I'd have wheat or not, but worried about whether I would have enough to germinate for the next season. So um, we basically just planted almost everything we had, knowing that the germination rate would be really low because the the part the important like the, the 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 part that's the code for the next year's wheat was the part that this particular mold affected and uh, we had our fingers crossed and we were all very you know nervous and yeah but yeah we had a good crop i mean we over sowed so there was definitely like as far as germination rate it was very low but we also planted about three times as much in the same area so yeah so we're back up to we've got wheat stock i'm um, selling wheat wheat berries and during the winter, I'll be milling wheat, but I just, there's no, I've got to sell some apples before I can get to my mill. <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, so it's, it, it was, it was, but it was really like stressful to get to that stage where you're like, oh, you know, this, this is what it means, you know, to have a bad year kind of thing. Um, but yeah, so our wheat is a, it's a bread variety of wheat. So it's a hard wheat, which is why it's, we save our seed because a lot of wheat is grown in Nagano, but it tends to be a soft wheat that's used for udon or mixed into soba flour for soba. So, um, yeah, it was like, oh, golly. <laughs> um, and plus, when you grow your own from your own seed, you know that there is no, um, you know, chemicals or hybrid. Like it's it, it's that whole heirloom seed philosophy. Are you, that... are you using it to make bread? What are you using the wheat for? Um, personally uh i use it for everything <laughs> it, i mean i i don't make chiffon cakes or um anything fancy like i make a lot of banana cake chocolate cake so and if you add baking powder you know it rises but i i wouldn't recommend it to people who are into fancy cakes because i'm sure it's not the right flour for it um i don't make a lot of bread bread um 
just because I'm, I'm not I'm not organized enough. <laughs> But I do make I make scones and I, we make, we make a lot of pizza so I make pizza pizza bases um, with it, but uh, but yeah it's it I I I I've seen the things that people make with it <laughs> and I, I think uh, wheatgrass um I, I guess it's easier to grow from because it doesn't have any like preservative or growth retardants on it so I I sell it to people who grow wheatgrass and put that in I think smoothies I'm sorry I never actually asked what they do with the wheatgrass. <laughs> And the wheat, the wheat berries, you can use in a variety of ways as well, right? Yeah, um, we we used to um, put some in with our rice cooker. Um, for a while, we were eating um, at mugi gohan, like like adding the uh, wheat to that. Um, and I've also seen people make a kind of a porridge. I hesitate to call it porridge because it didn't look very thick, <laughs> but like um, a, a gruel, some kind of like a heated gruel. And someone also sent me a picture. I believe it was boiled and then toasted, and then it's is it a Middle Eastern salad? Like it was like you know some like you might put like fried onions on your salad. It was Ooh, kind of a crunchy, yeah. it was a crunchy topping for a salad. But um, but yeah, personally, I'm when people ask, what do you do with your rhubarb? I'm like nothing. I just eat it. Like I'm like I'm too tired. <laughs> but other people do amazing things with my rhubarb. <laughs> Yeah, no, I I loved your rhubarb. We made the most amazing crumbles, and I think uh, I put it in like a cake as well, like a yeah, rhubarb yeah, yeah. cake with banana. That was awesome. Um, one thing I did with the wheat berries is I made a mistake because it, it. I love that you send them in the paper bags, just like the rice that we got from you. Um, thank you so much for not using plastic. I love that. Um, but I just put it straight in the rice cooker, washed it, and think thought it was ginmai, oh. and cooked it up like just straight wheat berries. My daughter ended up eating it like a full <laughs> plate of it, as if it was rice. And she's like, "It's a bit strange, but it tastes okay, <laughs> mommy." Like, <laughs> yeah, like so it's not to... bad, even eating straight. <laughs> apparently, <laughs> if it, um, if there's enough water, or if you use the soak function. They actually kind of burst a little bit like barley, and I find them, um, yeah, in the rice cooker like that. If I put it in and just press cook straight away, your daughter's a stronger woman than I am. <laughs> but with a little bit of a soak time, when they kind of burst open, there's like a, a almost like a nutty flavor, or yeah. But I wouldn't recommend it three meals a day. I think you might like have some issues. <laughs> Oh, we, um, oh, thanks. Yeah, thanks for that. No, I, th I thought it was pretty good. And it feels so healthy to eat it. Mm. I loved it. Uh, we have a comment from Michael on Facebook. Thanks for joining, Michael. He says, hello, just as info regarding tractor driving license, it is not required as long as you operate it within your fields. A license theory and practice test needs to be passed is mandatory if you drive onto public roads. I uh, just got mine recently. Very good information. Thanks, Michael. Oh, I'm going to have to look into that because I, I thought it was on, on a regular license. It says Tokubetsu Noki, and I thought I was covered under that. I do know that your tractor has to be licensed if you take it on a road. We have a number plate for our tractor because we drive it on the road. And I know that some tractors don't have a number plate if you only drive them within your field. So thank you. And Lucky, I do know the local cop. So, <laughs> yeah, I, it's probably like a regional to regional rule. Like, like in the U.S., we have state by state rules about that that kind of thing. Um, how old do you have to be to drive a tractor in Japan? Like in some, like Iowa, you can be from twelve or thirteen on a tractor. I don't know in in your fields in Nagano. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I think. Yeah, I'll, I will have to look into that. But I know on, on a license, there is a underneath, like where it says car underneath, it tells you different things that you can drive. It could be also be like you say, um, because licenses, my license is provided by Nagano. It might be an automatic thing, whereas I'm assuming in Tokyo, they wouldn't need, not everyone would need a tractor license. <laughs> but thank you, Michael. I'll definitely look into that because, yeah, yeah <laughs> going to good. jail for improper tractor driving doesn't sound like a good no, idea. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, you don't want to get in trouble. Um, one, one of the things that you're doing now, it looks like, is storing vegetables for winter. Yes. Um, so here you've got your potatoes and you've had kind of a hit and miss 
situation over the years trying to store potatoes over winter. So you grow what your target is to grow enough for your family. And that includes keeping enough over the winter to use for your family, right? Like you freeze tomatoes yeah. and stuff like yeah. that. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your process? Well, I'm, I'm incredibly stubborn. So I, 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 my family only eats the vegetables that we grow um, other than mushrooms. I don't grow enough mushrooms. But that doesn't mean that we have tomato and broccoli 12 months a year. It means that I grow enough for us to have a, ver a variety of vegetables at any time of the year. By February, my kids would probably sell me for a tomato. <laughs> <They're> like, <laughs> but um, no, that they appreciate. And the older they've got, that the more they appreciate it. And when they were younger, they had school lunch. They they got they got their summer vegetables in winter at school lunch. But um, but yeah. So I grow all of our potatoes, all of our onions, our garlic, our pumpkins. Um, yeah, everything that I grow, our family. Like that's why I said to people, like if you're ever unhappy with the quality, please let me know. A, because I want you to be happy, and B, because my family's eating it too. So, <laughs> like, I need to know if there's a problem. So, yeah, so we grow, um, and we have a combination of uh, things that I overwinter. So, I don't pull my uh, hucks, like my Chinese cabbage and my daikon, I leave them in the ground um, because I found that the top part will freeze, but underground is really good insulation for the daikon and carrots. Carrots, I will literally dig through the snow and pull my carrots um and they're fine um they're you know they're they the soil insulates so well um beets as well i keep some in the ground for us um the the chinese cabbage the very outside leaves that you don't even see if you buy it in the supermarket they're all chopped off i tie them around the cabbage with um rice straw or with um a hemp twine and that that insulates the um cabbage now i wouldn't say that they are the same quality that you can buy at the shop but i mean what's wrong with them is they're a little bit frozen now in winter we normally eat our uh haksai in soup or stew or um nabe so it doesn't matter to me if it's a little bit frozen because it's going to be very floppy by the time we eat it so so yeah i do a, a combination and then the potatoes and pumpkins we bring in and yeah the first couple of years i put them out we've got a kuda like the old-fashioned stone but it doesn't have a door and I'm like, well, it's got these big concrete, thick, thick walls. So that's insulation enough. And if things freeze, they're still edible. If things freeze and thaw, they turn revolting in like a day. So, so now, yeah, I keep all of the potatoes in my front entrance way. Um, sweet potatoes, we actually keep in old fashioned tea chests, which are wooden chests with a metal insert. And we fill it with rice husks, the very outside part of the rice husk. And then in, that um we keep the 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 more um like delicate vegetables are kept in that and the rice husks have like a moisture absorption um if, if it's as well as insulation so uh they tend to keep things better but again by march like you know it's one for the chickens one for me one for the chickens but i mean i also feed the chickens from what we have so you know it everything works out but um but potatoes have yeah oh look at them <laughs> the, the potatoes uh i had thought were a lot hardier than they are so and they don't they don't show their damage on the outside but you get like a black ring inside when they um when they they're not happy so but yeah, it's a learning experience, but um, it's it's something that I really it's it's important to me. Um, and yeah, and then kale, kale and chard and uh, uh, spinach all grow all through the winter. Um, in fact, in in some places in um, in Nihonmatsu in Fukushima, they sell snow spinach because they say it's sweeter because all the sugars in the plant are kind of suspended; they don't turn to starch. So. Yeah, that's even in Nagano, there's quite a few vegetables that I can just, I, I just put a stick where the row is. So when the snow is there, I know where to dig because there's nothing worse than sneaking out in your pajamas and sandals to get something to make for a, a bento box and digging in the wrong place. And you're like, I'm freezing. <laughs> oh, that would be awful. And uh, I just want to show this. You were talking about uh, feeding your vegetables to your kids, your family all year. I love this little story. You had these beautiful <laughs> pineapple tomatoes and you made a chili. 
and your kids were very dubious because it was the wrong color. It looks amazing. My kids, yeah, my kids kind of think of me as a little bit out there. Like, you know, if they if they eat something, they're like, "Is this spinach?" I said, "Yes," and they're like, "Normal spinach," and I say, "Yes." They're like, "Like, like hold in, so mom." I'm like, "Yes." Like. You're sure. Yes. <laughs> There's some trust issues over it. <laughs> but yeah, so yellow chili, they're like, is it just normal tomatoes? I said, yeah, the same ones we had in the salad. So like tomatoes, not tomatillos, not something. Like, yeah, like 100%. But when they ate it, they were happy with it. But yeah, something that looks unusual around here, they're like, what are you feeding us? <laughs> Because you do have some unique things. And we had an interesting conversation last time. You were talking about how rhubarb is actually kind of a native plant for Nagano. Because to me, I never see rhubarb here. Mm -hmm. But um, you do have some more unusual plants that maybe your neighbors aren't growing. I yeah, love I the sun chokes. Is that, is that something you brought in? You know, this, this is actually really common in this area. Um, they use them as like uh, they they pickle them in miso and maybe sake leaves, but they're um, kikui mo like the the our, our sun chokes um, are an old kind of health food in this area. Um, they're supposed to be I'm, I'm telling you <laughs> they're supposed to be good for your um, your blood like to make your and and like lower cholesterol so. I didn't know what they were when I was first eating these pickles and I'd seen the yellow flowers and I'd eaten the pickles and I'd never put two and two together. And then someone was visiting and she said, Oh, do you have sun jokes? And I'm like, don't think so. Like, <laughs> and she's like, and she started pulling up these yellow, they, they're like, cause they get like two meters high. They get really huge. And, um, and I was like, Oh, those are those pickles because <laughs> i in australia i'm not sure whether they're not po popular in australia or at the time where i was living in the area i was living in australia um they just i mean i we didn't even really see eggplants when i was little so <laughs> but um but yeah i'd never seen them and um and then I, yeah i i the, the, the way they stay crunchy um when they're pickled is really nice and then also um like baked like a baked vegetable so yeah yeah like even in a roasting tray yeah. like if i do the sunchokes and sweet potatoes and potatoes and uh like pumpkin kabocha or squash in the same baking tray that's such a nice meal and it's so simple and last time i did my order you had like a baking herb set that you sent with it that was so gorgeous so that's like bay leaves and rosemary and stuff. It was Is that right? sage, rosemary, thyme, and then if if there's like during the summer months, there's also you can ask for parsley and chives. But yeah, I just when I started when I was sending pump butternuts, I, I love butternut and sage. I just think that's an amazing combination. And I started just throwing a couple of leaves in. And then people were like, can I buy the herbs? I was like, I don't know. Like, <laughs> but yeah, I, I personally, I think um, that burnt butter sage with butternut is just so good. <laughs> so good. So good. Now, I just want to show this butternut picture because some people <laughs> on Twitter were sharing um, butternuts are now in a lot of shops around Japan. But oh, a wow. recent trend, I think, um, who was who is talking about this? on Twitter, putting eye stickers on them to make them look more cute so people would buy them. I, I love them without the eyes as well. But yeah, there's a little trend going on. Do you put eye stickers on yours when you sell them? No, I don't. <laughs> but it is funny because um, I became known locally as the person who grows those strange pumpkins. <laughs> and then, like, as you say, like butter, the word butternut became more and I, a couple of the older people I had one lady was saying you grow the peanut butter right I, I, no I don't even grow peanuts and it turned out she meant but butter nut <laughs> but um they were asking me they're like but it's sticky right it's not it's not like a real pumpkin and I, and I always point out like there's different kinds of sweet potato you've got like anoimo is the sticky one and then and um they're like, yeah, but you couldn't use it in like Nimono. It would be terrible. I'm like, yeah, but you don't have to just eat Nimono. <laughs> so, but it is, yeah, it, it became, I think it was on a couple of like those TV variety, like the the morning, the daytime shows. And uh, my mother-in-law, who I always send some to, 
was quite quite famous in the neighborhood. Like, uh, this is the butternut. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, again, a wonderful vegetable just to do simple roasting. I would imagine it would work with vegetable tempura. I never make tempura myself, but it, it seems like it would work, no? I mean, they use other wet vegetables in tempura. So I mean, yeah, I, I don't I don't make tempura. <laughs> but but uh I know um soup, it's quite it's quite popular, um, like potage style soup. Um and I think that baked people who are like showing how to do like slices in the fish grill um, for like the Japanese way of using it. But uh, yeah, my mother-in-law, um, she um, makes up like a puree and then she freezes the blocks of puree. And then in the morning when she, she microwaves it and adds milk and a bit of pepper and she has that for her, um, she, she, yeah. So I think that must have been the kind of style that they were talking about, like a pumpkin soup style of eating it but uh i mean it's i think it's a great pumpkin because the bit you don't eat is like concentrated here and like compared to a regular pumpkin i think you get really good value for <laughs> value yeah. for your pumpkin like <laughs> definitely um now as a natural organic farmer uh one thing we talked about last time was your your kids are are raised to pick off the insects um you showed a beautiful blueberry uh, picture yeah. with this beautiful, gorgeous spider just in time for Halloween here. <laughs> um, what insect problems have you had? If any, are you are you able to kind of distract them with nearby flowers or what's your strategy to yeah. grow things without pesticides or fertilizers? I'm. I really, like I said, I, I don't have a lot of, every winter I go, okay, I'm going to look into the science of that. And every winter I don't. But so I'm talking completely anecdotally here. Um, I find the less I interfere, the more I allow the natural balance of the system, the fewer problems I have. Um, that said, I do squash every cabbage moth butterfly I find because those things are so tiny and so hungry. Like there is a reason why there's a very hungry caterpillar. <laughs> so those ones I definitely, but even aphids, I pull off the leaves that have aphids on them and feed them to the chickens. But I don't spray for anything because if you look long enough, I really do believe that you'll see the ladybirds or the wasps or the other predatory insects. So I don't see it as, I mean, yeah, I, I, I'm a total hypocrite because I squash all of those caterpillars. But, but I, um, I, I really do think that if you focus on, like, I have an aphid problem, what you're missing is that you have, like, a harmony problem. Like, do you have enough things flowering that are going to attract predators? Or what else is going wrong in the whole system that this is happening? So if I have... Um, if I transplanted during a harsh time of year or there wasn't enough water or something, then those plants will be weak. And that tends to be where the insects go. So in that case, the insects are showing me this is a crop that you're probably not going to, it's not going to be worth, you know, looking after. So yeah, I really, I really try to focus on the whole system um, again, which is why I don't, I don't discourage wasps and um, uh, I don't know what the English name, Udo. I don't know the English. You know, like um, people eat it in the spring. It's a it's a one of them wild mountain vegetables. Now it flowers very late for Nagano. It's one of the last things to flower. And I've taken videos before. The sound is amazing. There are flies and insects and bees and wasps and just and bugs and just everything. And a lot of people chop the udo back because you only want the spring growth. So by the end of midsummer, it's like asparagus. You could definitely chop all everything off and you wouldn't have a problem. Now, it's very big and sprawling. So I can understand chopping it back. But we chop it back only on the side that it's like interfering with the vegetables and leave the entire other side. And I really believe that that kind of looking after the, the whole insect system helps with. Um, so, yeah, so this year, knock on wood, <laughs> I didn't have um particular bug problems um but i do i did like i planted an onion 
in every um, uh, Japanese onion with every pumpkin plant because I've noticed that when the pumpkin plants are just transplanted again, they're probably feeling a bit weak and they're putting off signals like, not coping here. And they tend to get a lot of aphids. And when a small plant gets a lot of aphids, it actually really stunts the growth. So I I'm wanting to stop that. But yeah, I don't use, I didn't use any sprays this year. And even non cabbage moth caterpillars, I, I leave them because I figure, you know, the caterpillars become butterflies. And again, it's a hypocritical to be taking photos of beautiful butterflies and killing caterpillars at the same time. <laughs> like, <laughs> But it's, it's all about finding your rhythm as a farmer, yeah. but also finding a rhythm with your fields and nature and harmony in general with your surroundings. I love this picture of the frog on a rainy day and how you were struggling through trying to get things done, sudden yeah. downpour, and then you were reminded by this frog to just take it as it comes, right? And it didn't move for ages. It just sat there. And I was like, yeah, just to slow down and just, you know, t take a break when you have to take a break. <laughs> but I do want to say, like, I'm very privileged in that my my kids being able to be fed or going to school doesn't rely on my vegetable income. So, I, you know, no shade to any farmer who does do inputs and who does try to control things better. Like this works for me in my situation. And I feel very privileged that it, that I, it does work for me. Um, so yeah, I always want to be careful when I'm like, you know, I'm not saying nobody should ever destroy any insect everywhere because like that's not, you know, it's it's not at all practical for a lot of people in a lot of situations. But the way we've been able to make it work for us um, is something that we're very conscious. It's not an accident that we, we're doing things this way. But at the same time, we don't live on a deserted island. So if something was to happen in my field, I probably would have to destroy a crop rather than risk it spreading to a different field. So, um, yeah, that, that, that everything is a risk, right? Like everything is, <laughs> you're rolling the dice every season, like what's going to happen. But, but yeah, I think, I, I feel like it's, it's not pure luck. By this stage, we've got to the point where, um, you know, even like transplanting, like I look at the, the long-term weather forecast and I say, okay, if it's going to rain, Thursday, I'm going to transplant Wednesday, because then I know that, you know, the next day, um, they'll get watered well. So there's a lot of like that kind of planning, which I think at, in when I was first starting, I would be like, well, I'll just do this today, because I feel like it like, and, and now I'm much more in tune with everything. And even knowing, um, like you said, like microclimates, like where you used to live to where you are now, even just in in the fields I've got, the one that's closest to the mountain will be colder for longer. So if I'm planting something in the three areas, yeah, I'll start at the rice paddy, which is our furthest down the hill. And then I'll, but after like 10 or 11, when the sun has hit the higher fields, then I'll work up there. So it's just, yeah, I guess it's, it's really getting to know your environment. Um, also, as the seasons are changing or you might have less rain than usual one year, um, it looks like you're using these sheets like to cover and keep the the weeds yeah. from coming up, but also maybe retain moisture. Now, it looks like some of the sheets that you're using are reusable and some are single use. Is that just a cost consideration or is it convenience? It's a it's a usage continuation. The re I, I wanted to do all reusable, but the reusable ones are more permeable. So depending on the use, um, we've got like we use some areas that we only use rice straw, so we don't even use the reusable sheets. So in the permanent beds, so asparagus, artichoke, rhubarb, and around the apples, it's only rice straw. Um, and then every year we add another layer, which means that the one below it, because as it breaks down, it becomes soil and the new one at, works as the new um, weed suppressant and insulation kind of thing. Um, and I tried doing that in a couple of vegetable beds as well. But I think just the scale is um, it's, it's just difficult to keep on top of. And weeds can get through the rice straw, so it does require more weeding. Um, the reusable weed mat I use all through the pumpkins and I use 
through the pumpkins and around the potatoes and things. And I've got like the holes punched in it. So the spacing is the same. So it saves a lot of time. Um, I grow a lot of tomatoes. And so far, um, because we're a little bit colder than tomatoes particularly like, the plastic, single use plastic has a more of an insulating effect. And I, I've tried, like I tried, you know, I ran a experiment. I tried one row of this and one row of that. And I just wasn't getting the um, the harvest, the yield from the other one. And like I said, it's, I'm not happy with it. And I'm continuing to um, look into alternatives. But at the same time, I need this year's crop while I think what to do in the future. So, yeah, it, the ideal is everything is reusable. Everything is um or even not having to use it using all natural things that come from the um you know the other fields but at this stage i haven't completely been able to get rid of the single use plastic yeah no i understand that it's all finding a balance yeah. with what works and what's going to give you the most yield but also what's most effective and time efficient as well as cost efficient right so now, just, looking at the pictures of the rice paddies, this is the reason Japanese rice is grown in water, right? To keep the weeds down. Is that right? Oh, yeah. I think um, the I think most rice, I'm not sure about, I think even in Australia, they, they, they grow in floodplains. I'm not sure about California rice, but I know I follow a couple on Instagram, a couple of rice farmers in, no, I'm going to forget. I think it's Georgia, somewhere in the southern US. <laughs> and, and it's all grown in water. I think what's different about the Japanese one is the the rebuilding the sides of the paddy each time. So it keeps the um, it keeps the weeds down, uh, but it doesn't keep down weeds that are in the same family. So there's a weed called here, which is um, it's it's long and it has a grain on the top, which is very difficult once it. It's, it's actually one of the main ingredients in budgie mix. If you have a, a budgie and you, the little round seeds, <laughs> that those are, um, those are here. So, um, but it's, that that's a particularly difficult one for the rice farmers because um, when, when they apply pest uh, herbicide, it's usually for broad leafed things and anything, they can't put in something that's going to kill <laughs> rice. So it's very difficult for them. But um yeah, we, we we keep that carpet of green again because we want to look after the um, the soil even in the rice paddy, and so we don't eat, we don't add any um, chicken manure or like a lot of they use a chemical fertilizer in between, whereas we use the flooding and rotting of the rice straw as the only input. So um, yeah, it's it's just it's just a a different approach to it. And I, I love your rice. It's delicious. We're, oh, we're enjoying it as a family. Uh, Liz, we didn't talk too much about your chickens. Tell us about your chickens. How, how are they? How long are you able to keep the same chickens? Are they able to stay healthy pretty easy? We have a chicken nursing home. <laughs> so I am the big chicken fan in the family. I grow them from day old chicks. And they get used to me and my kids are like them my kids come and hang with them and like they want when they're little yellow fluff balls i mean who doesn't love a little yellow fluff ball and then when they get a bit older um when my kids were younger uh i used to put them on what we called chook check and chook check was you got to sit outside with your book or whatever you were doing but you had to they're, they're too little when they're free ranging in a little like a playpen like a kid's playpen they're too little, like a crow or anything could attack them. So someone has to be in the vicinity to just keep them all happy. And uh, now that they're high schoolers, when I say, who wants to do trip check? They're kind of like, oh, mom. <laughs> but, uh, but they free range over most of our backyard during the day. And then I lock them up at night just because we've got weasels and we've got huckabishin and we've got foxes and we've got cats and all of that. But um, they're, the variety we have, is uh, bred for Shinshu's climate so they can stand the cold and um, they're related to the Nagoya Kochin which is quite a famous Japanese hen but they're a Shinshu um, like a, a Nagano original and they lay from about 10 months old 11 months old they lay reliably like one egg a, one egg a day for about two years 
And after that, if you were running like a professional operation, you'd get rid of them and bring in your next flock because they're no longer commercially viable. And a couple of times we took them to someone who butchers his own um, for his own consumption. But my husband, who he thinks that the chooks don't listen to him because I speak to them in English. And so he's, he tries out his English. No, stop, stop, wait, wait. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he, he's a big, big softy and didn't like, he felt like they've given their service to us. So our service to them is to look after them. But I think because they're bred to have uh, a short life, they, they tend not to live longer than five years, which I think is a lot less than a, wild chicken would but yeah so we have the grandmas who lay an egg maybe a couple of times a week living with the younger hens so um and as long as they have a big enough run that's fine like normally it's very difficult to integrate younger and older birds because like the whole word pecking order comes from the way you know chickens attack each other but um because we have enough space and because there's always you know food and things to scratch um yeah, they, they get along, but yeah, yeah it's, were, it's actually were talking about it, it becoming like a, a adventure trying to find where they put the, the eggs that they don't lay them in the same place all the time. <laughs> I, you wouldn't believe I'll have to take another photo and update that I have made like the nesting box, like day spa of chicken nesting boxes to encourage everyone to come in the same area. And I found one like be between a chainsaw and like an empty crate. I'm like, that's not even comfortable, guys. Like, have a look over here at like the five-star hotel of nesting boxes. Yeah, they're not and convinced. <laughs> it's like when you buy your kids presents and they just want to play with the box. Right. Or cats. <laughs> cats love boxes as well. Uh, great question here from Michael. Have you tried or would you consider using ducks? for weed control and direct fertilizer on your organic rice fields, which sadly is not much practiced in this era. Yes, sometimes in Japan you do see ducks and I'm so happy and yay, organic. Um, have you ever used ducks? We have. Um, we did ducks for, I'm guessing maybe five years. Our field is a little bit too big to be manageable with ducks. I think if you have a look at the duck fields, they tend to be small squares, which means that they can run an electric fence around the outside. Um, our field is one really big field, which makes it more difficult to do that. And also because we're softies, some of the more, what's the word, practical rice farmers go, well, as long, as long as the ducks are active for about three weeks after planting, they've kept the seed bank down. Which, and so then if crows, hawks, foxes get them, well, that saved you having to feed them is... I mean, I'm not saying everyone feels like this, but when I went, we had a really bad year where we lost 12 ducks over a weekend. We had 30, but we lost 12 over a weekend. And my husband and I were like, like you know, we're responsible. Like we did this and we were out there with nets. We netted our entire field. And that's a huge field. Like I was crying by the end. I was like, this is not work. Like we're netting one end and literally like a tombi, is it a whistling kite is literally like strafing the other end as I'm in the field, like not even afraid of me. So um, we, we, we ended up having, making the decision that it wasn't for us because it was just, we couldn't deal with it. But that, that time I knew a couple of other duck rice farmers and I went and I said like, how are you guys doing it? Like, show me your setup. Like we are losing ducks. And uh, one guy who I, you know, I have a number of different philosophical differences, but he, um, <laughs> he has this massive beard and he's just sitting there going, your weeds should be down by now. Like, what's the problem? And I'm like, well, yeah, but like we're losing ducks, these poor ducks. And he's like, you were going to eat them at the end of the season. <laughs> I was just like, okay, well, <laughs> so yeah, we're a little bit too soft, but we have done ducks. And I, if someone has a small enough, Field to be able to do an electric fence because predation, predation like we're around our rice field there's no houses so again maybe if your rice field is closer to a house or to a road where cars are coming but um it's great like you get amazing rice um you get really good yields because of the fertilizer um and the weeds are kept down and they're just fun ducks are so fun and um, they're beautiful as well like and the they love you they just 
and they pick at you. They're like they're constantly like you know they're always like they're just like yeah they're so much fun. But um, I, I I'm actually surprised that Michael said it's it's going down. I feel like in the last five years there's been with the I turn and like the people moving back to the country, pr- like around me I've seen. I mean, not lots. It's probably five percent of total rice farmers, but I've seen like dotting here and there. I feel like I've seen more people using iGamo. But again, I'm not. I'm not. I, I have some issues with uh, uh, the general cultural view on animals in general in Japan. I'm not sure a lot of those ducks are people's pets. <laughs> yeah, as long as they're they're treated fairly and given、uh, lots of good food and fly around while they're alive, there's not much more you can ask, right? Yeah.、Um, think- thank you so much, Heather. That's all the time we've got today, and. I just want to say how much I appreciate you and all the other farmers in Japan who are persevering. I know it's not the easiest work.、Uh, we appreciate you guys growing food. It's so important for us to have food security in Japan, and we know the number of farmers is going down every year. So I love getting your produce, but also I'm just so happy you do what you do. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for the opportunity. And yeah, just I would like to say, everyone, have a look around in your area and see if you can find seconds, because there's seconds for like nagaimo, there's seconds for so many different vegetables, and、um, it's a great. It can often be a great deal for you, but also you can help out the local farmers.、Um, I think some of the chokubai show now, like the the farmers market, no,、um, the, what do you call it? Like the the direct. Farm sales stores. If you ask them, like, do they have seconds?、Um, you know, you can buy. It's often sold as pickling or kakoyo for processing. So if you ask for, like, do you have kakoyo fruit or kakoyo daikon or whatever?、Um, yeah, because hopefully, like, I I think that my goal would be to get Japan to lower their standards a little bit, <laughs> make and make a yeah, and make it more available to everyone. But thank you for the time this morning. Yeah, definitely. And everybody, have a look at Nagano Naturally dot com. <laughs> And、uh, Heather, you're great about just putting on what you have. So anything you see on the website is something you can order right now. And、uh, it goes season by season. So keep up the great work. Thank you, Heather. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Have a great day. Take care. Bye.